If your period does something weird and you're having sex with someone who can get you pregnant, take a pregnancy test. How many times have you heard me say that on this channel? I still am a little confused why she never take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Just take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Always take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Take a pregnancy test. Did you know that the first year in pregnancy test available for over-the-counter purchase in the United States wasn't introduced until 1978 at all? That was 44 years ago. So what were people doing before the advent of modern pregnancy tests? Today's video, I'm going to tell you because we are reviewing vintage methods for testing for pregnancy. Fair warning, one of them includes frogs. The first vintage pregnancy test method we're talking about goes back to the days of the Berlin Papyrus. The Berlin Papyrus is a historical document that provides a lot of insight into ancient Egyptian culture, particularly for math and medicine. It dates back to somewhere around 1800 BC. It also includes writings on a test for a woman who will bear or not bear, meaning a test for pregnancy. It instructs you to gather a bag of wheat and a bag of spelt. Those are to be laid outside of the house and the woman is to water them daily with her urine. Yes, you heard that right. Every day for several days, she pees on the wheat and spelt bags. Then they go out and they check to see if anything is growing in the urine watered wheat and spelt bags. If both bags sprout and grow, she's definitely pregnant. If only one sprouts and grows, you've been lucky enough to get some insight into the sex of the baby that she's pregnant with. Wheat for boys and spelt for girls. Although admittedly, there's some historical argumentation regarding which sex is represented by which grain. <laughs> This is so interesting to me. Uh, uh, researching this video is one of the funnest things I've ever done. I find all of this really interesting because it seems like even then there was some understanding that the urine of people who are pregnant is somehow unique to people who aren't. And you will see that as a theme throughout this whole video. Pregnant urine is basically magic. Of course, now we use the urinary magic of HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is a gonadotropin or hormone that was identified in the 1920s to test for pregnancy using a urine pregnancy test. But I find it really fascinating that even back then in the days of the Berlin Papyrus, this was something that they could identify. Pregnant urine is somehow unique. There have actually been various modern attempts to prove or disprove whether the urine on grains actually works as a pregnancy test. So one researcher actually found that non-pregnant urine prevented growth of these grains, but that pregnant urine allowed for growth, albeit at a slower pace than water, which honestly, duh, I can't believe it even grows at all with all the ammonia and stuff that's in urine. It seems like that would be super toxic to plants, but however, in this same research, the absence of growth was not a good way to rule out pregnancy, meaning if you put the urine on the grains and nothing grew, the person might still be pregnant. So growth could indicate pregnancy, but absence of growth could not rule out pregnancy. Really fascinating to me in all of this is that we still aren't 100% sure what the compound in the urine is that causes this differentiation between pregnant and not pregnant prompting growth of the grains. So we know it's not what you would typically think of, which is the gonadotropins like HCG, which is what we use in pregnancy tests now, because it still works if the urine is boiled or dialyzed prior to putting it on the plants. So that would break down gonadotropins, that would break down proteins, that would break down electrolytes. So we can effectively rule those things out. There's some people who think it might be related to estrogen levels. So if you are pregnant, you have higher estrogen levels. That means you have more estrogen breakdown products that are leaving the body. Estrogen is relatively stable in heat and wouldn't be dialyzed out. So perhaps that can influence plant growth. The ancient Egyptian plant pee pregnancy test gets a seven out of 10 for me for being safe, ahead of its time and having some validity within the modern research when we look back at it. The ancient Greeks, however, did not get so close to accurate when their methods of pregnancy testing were reviewed in hindsight through modern lenses. Around 400 BC, the notable Greek physician Hippocrates, who you may or may not have heard of, was recommending that a combination of honey and water be drunk and that if painful abdominal distension occurred, then the person was pregnant, which, 
is an interesting theory that I could find no modern backing for. The Greeks actually had several tests, and unlike the other two tests that I just discussed, from ancient Egypt and from Hippocrates, I couldn't really find the primary source for the next one I'm going to tell you about, but I'm still going to tell you about it because I saw it in a lot of places and it's very interesting to me. So the general description of this one is that if a woman thought she was pregnant, she would place an onion deep in the vagina prior to bed. And when she woke up, if her breath smelled of onion, then she was pregnant or she wasn't, depending on where you read the accounts of this testing method. In the ones that said, if the onion breath exited the mouth, the person was not pregnant. The idea there was that the onion was in the vagina and its fumes would waft through the body, which is of course, as everybody knows, a hollow tube to your mouth and out of the mouth, meaning there was nothing in the uterus to prevent the wafting of the onion smell and it could exit the mouth. But, if there was something blocking that, like a fetus in the uterus, then the onion smell could not waft as that made a blockage <laughs> from the vagina to the uterus to the mouth, and thus you would not wake up with onion breath if you had a fetus in your uterus. The places that say onion breath equals pregnant base it around the idea that increased blood flow in the vaginal mucosa during pregnancy allows for absorption and transfer of the sulfuric compounds in an onion into the bloodstream and then out of the mouth. And while it is true that you have more blood flow in the vagina and surrounding tissues during pregnancy, please don't put onions in your vagina. I would just recommend going and peeing on some cereal to see if it sprouts instead. Ancient Greece gets a two out of 10 for the honey and water test because it's relatively harmless, but also sounds a little bit painful and probably not at all reliable. And a zero out of 10 for the onion test because even in ancient Greece, the vagina was not a vegetable garden. So the next one is called Piss Prophets and Admittedly, I can't find a lot of primary historical literature for this as well, but the pop culture articles that have been written about it almost all cite Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, who is a medical historian. So I'm assuming that this person has done some research and probably has written about this in their books and likely does have some historical text that they have referred to for this. These tests start with something called a urine wheel, which seems to be championed by, but possibly not invented by a Greek physician called Galen, who was born born in 120 AD, practitioners would use this medical wheel to assess the smell, look, and yes, I am serious, even the taste of their patient's urine in order to assess health and make a diagnosis. Dr. Fitzharris, who I briefly mentioned in the intro of this section, actually has a really interesting and entertaining YouTube video all about urine wheels and uroscopy. I'll link it below along with an article she wrote that was really helpful on researching for this section. These wheels continue to make historical appearances throughout the 16th and 17th century, and eventually the practice of uroscopy morphs into something that is even more fascinating to me, which is called uroscopy. Romancy, and I definitely don't know if I'm saying that right, so I will put the spelling on the screen for you. Uromancy was the idea that one could seek divine knowledge from urine, and from this idea, we get the first mention of piss prophets. These were people who would use the divine knowledge that they found within urine to predict the future. This was used for many things, including, but definitely not limited to, diagnosing pregnancy and if a known pregnancy was already in existence, predicting the sex of the fetus that was being carried. Ancient Greeks had all kinds of other methods that they used from soaking a metal object in urine from somebody, and if it rusted, that meant that they were pregnant, to postulating that pregnant people's urine had tiny worms in it, and even to mixing urine with wine, which I don't know why they would waste good wine like that, but that was one of their methods as well. Through Dr. Fitzharris's articles, I came across this really fascinating painting from the Welcome Collection in London, and it depicts a piss prophet. They're viewing a urine specimen, and if you look closely, you can see a small humanoid figure inside of the container that they're holding. This is thought to represent pregnancy confirmation, and the presumed mother in this video, the mother of the person whose urine is being tested, appears to be quite angry with her possibly pregnant daughter. I just wanted to include that historical art piece in there because I personally found it to be very interesting to look at. This one gets a four out of 10 from me, completely inaccurate, but incredibly interesting. And honestly, they deserve at least some points for being so dedicated to their craft that they regularly were tasting 
other people's urine. Now that we're entering into the 16th century, we can discuss French physician Jacques Guillermo, a surgeon who made contributions to pediatrics, obstetrics, and eyes, ophthalmology. Why did I say eyes? <laughs> he contributed to obstetrics, pediatrics, and ophthalmology in ways that still shape our practices today. In his book, Childbirth, also known as The Happy Delivery of Women, which was written probably sometime in the late 1500s or early 1600s, Guillermo discusses that he can identify pregnancy by looking at the eyes as early as the second month. His diagnosis worked on the idea that the eyes have significant changes that are related to pregnancy. So he theorized that the eyes become deeper set, the pupils are more constricted, the blood vessels of the eyes are engorged, and that the eyelids are more droopy in someone who is pregnant. The eyes, Chico, they never lie. Despite his confidence in his methods, he was quite vocal about the importance of not misdiagnosing someone as pregnant when they were not. Not because of the stress or discomfort that that might cause to the person he was diagnosing, specifically because of the embarrassment that that would lead the male doctor who had misdiagnosed them to have. Nothing was more ridiculous than after having insisted that a woman is pregnant to seeing her womb produce menstrual blood or a quantity of water or to hear various winds exit from it instead of a child. Nothing is more embarrassing for male doctors in the 15th and 16th century than misdiagnosing a bad case of gas as pregnancy. While researching for this video, I somehow stumbled upon a really interesting master's thesis called The Pretty Art of Detecting Pregnancy in the Duchess of Malfi, written by someone named Claire McEwen Duncan. If you're watching this for some reason, excellent work. I thoroughly enjoyed your thesis, and I hope that you graduated with honors. I will link it below if anyone else is interested in reading it as well. Guillermo gets a two out of 10 for me. Although there are changes to the eyes in pregnancy, I think eyes are disgusting, and I'm really happy ophthalmologists exist and that I don't have to be one of them. Moving into the 19th century, we can now discuss famed American gynecologist James Reed Chadwick, who is often credited with being the first to describe the venous congestion that is caused by pregnancy, which leads to a bluish hue of the vaginal mucosa and vulva. I had been taught, or perhaps I assumed, that because this was called Chadwick's sign, that meant that he was the first to describe this phenomenon. Interestingly, while he did bring attention to this phenomenon at the American Gynecologic Society meeting in 1886, and he also published a paper on it in 1887, he very clearly stated in his paper that he was not the first to describe this. He gave clear credit in his paper to Etienne Joseph Jackwoman as the first to document this, having originally described those findings a full 50 years prior to his bringing it up to the American Gynecologic Society. Despite his clear attribution in his own paper, this quickly became known as Chadwick's sign, and that error was propagated through medical literature for the next 100 plus years, with most people assuming that James Reed Chadwick had named the Chadwick sign as such because he discovered it, when in reality, he didn't even ask for it to be named after him. It just got picked up and he couldn't backtrack it. Meanwhile, Etienne's out there documenting and describing things which will be included in medical literature and teaching for the next millennia and getting absolutely no credit for it. As I researched for this video, it did seem that there was a modern effort to properly attribute the discovery of this to Etienne. Chadwick's sign gets a seven out of 10. Points for interestingness from a standpoint of pregnancy physiology and for withstanding the test of time to still be included in teaching for modern obstetrics even now, but points off for being a real life representation of the medical community's dirty little habit of getting only halfway through a publication before excitedly phoning a friend to tell them what we learned, thereby missing a few key details in the process. As I mentioned earlier, by the 1920s, we had made the discovery of the magic little hormone called HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. In 1927, two German scientists, Asham and Zondek, published a paper paper with a title that I am not even going to attempt to say. This publication described their findings of injecting urine from a pregnant human into sexually immature mice. And what they found is that upon injecting this urine into the mice, 
their ovaries would quickly mature and start to grow and create eggs. Why would that happen? HTG has a very similar structure to a hormone called LH or luteinizing hormone. This is the hormone that you produce rapidly in the middle of a cycle that induces ovulation. In fact, we make use of this relationship in modern medicine by utilizing HCG injections in people who are undergoing certain fertility treatments to assist with induction of ovulation. Asham and Zondek's discoveries led to the introduction of several other animal models which would be used to test for pregnancy throughout the early and mid 20th century. The test was adapted for use in rabbits, mice, and rats who were injected with urine from someone who who wanted to know if they were pregnant over the course of several days before the animal was unalived so that its ovaries could be assessed. If the animal's ovaries were found to be stimulated and producing eggs, the person was given their positive pregnancy test result. Obviously, this is a very reliable way for testing for pregnancy, but it's not exactly ideal. It's very expensive. It requires a lot of work and time and obviously relies on breeding and killing a whole bunch of animals just to do a pregnancy test. Because of those factors, this was really only used for absolute medical necessity in certain situations and for people who were ultra wealthy and could pay someone to do the testing themselves. Meanwhile, in 1930, British zoologist Lance Hogben was studying hormones by injecting them into frogs. And he somewhat accidentally found that injecting a frog with hormones from an ox pituitary would cause the frog to lay eggs, which is something they generally only do when they are mating. He went on to discover that injecting these same frogs with urine from a pregnant human would also reliably result in the frog laying eggs. This method of testing was quite reliable and unlike the rats, rabbits, and mice test, the animals didn't have to be sacrificed. They could reliably lay eggs within 12 hours and they could be used many times over to test various people. Doctors and patients were obviously ecstatic about this newfound ability to diagnose pregnancy reliably in a very quick amount of time. One doctor was actually quoted as writing Hogman a letter. Thank you for your report on the pregnancy test for Miss X. You may be interested to know that of one GP with many years standing, one specialist gynecologist and one frog, only the frog was correct. The frog method was used well into the 1960s when more modern tests were finally developed. Although it certainly wasn't routine or probably even overly common, that quite literally means that some of our parents and or grandparents almost certainly had their urine injected into a frog and patiently waited 12 hours for it to lay eggs to see if they were pregnant. Science is wild, y'all. The animal testing gets a six out of 10 for me. Points for being incredibly innovative and very reliable. I mean, honestly, why would you think that you should inject urine into an animal and then look at its ovaries? How do you even come up with that hypothesis? But points off because of the reliance on breeding and unaliving animals or utilizing frogs for their egg laying capabilities. I hope that you learned something today. If you did, leave a like on this video. If you'd like to watch another video, I will link a really good one for you right over there. Let me know in the comments down below what else you would like to learn about. If you're not subscribed and you'd like to be, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. I'll see you next Monday.